Greeting friends and colleagues. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you tonight uh, for just a few thoughts on what COVID might have to do with the history of art. My name is Lisa DeBoer and I teach art history at Westmont. Uh, and I'll be saying a few words about the theme of remembering our death. Um, um, a couple of themes around the representation of the plague and images associated with plague in the past. And then um, lastly, just an interesting little um, debate that occurred within my discipline specifically about the impact of the Black Death in the 14th century on the practice of art in Western Europe. Um, so I will minimize myself now and we can get started. So the larger overarching theme is that of remembering our mortality. Remember that we will die. Um, this is a theme that is common throughout Christianity. Um, the Latin phrase that is attached to that idea is memento mori. Um, and it, that is actually a kind of picture that is passed down through the history of art. And it's attached to thoughts like these that are embedded into the Christian tradition and grounded in scripture. Um, from Paul in Philippians, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So remembering our death is not necessarily just a sad and morbid thing. The Ash Wednesday liturgy, uh, preparing ourselves to celebrate Easter, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Um, and then in the rules of the Benedictine community, chapter four, there's 60 some rules for monks to follow and in the middle are a set that read like this, desire eternal life with all spiritual longing and keep death before one's eyes daily. Um, in fact, uh, St. Francis was often depicted in meditation with a skull, um, practicing this memento mori. Um, here we have a Spanish follower of the 17th century painter, late 16th, 17th century Italian painter, Caravaggio. This is Francisco Thurbaran giving us a beautiful, very haunting and solitary image of St. Francis in meditation. Um, scholars are often shown in the Christian tradition with a skull on their desk. Um, one of the original scholarly images comes down through pictures of St. Jerome, the person who translated the Bible from Hebrew into Latin, uh, the Old Testament, and St. Jerome is almost always shown with a skull on his desk. I sometimes say half jokingly to students that I think it would uh, bode a lot of us well to keep a skull on our desk, um, and then in fact, I do have a skull on my desk. Um, I don't have a human skull on my desk, but I do have this beautiful little sparrow skull on my desk, um, which reminds me both of the specificity of God's love, that even the sparrows are held in God's hand, uh, and the fact that we are mortal, uh, and the fact that we are wonderfully and fearfully made. This is just the amazing tiniest little skull. I keep it next to my computer. So framing thoughts on um, the usefulness of remembering our mortality. Um, earlier people really had very little difficulty remembering their mortality, understanding so little about the body and how it works, about disease and how it works, um, understanding all too well how accidents work. People um, lived closely with death, uh, much more closely than most of us do today, unless we are in a profession where we meet death regularly. Um, Durer here gives us a depiction uh, out of Revelation, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, from his blockbuster illustrations of the book of Revelation. Uh, take a look at the date on that picture. A lot of hysteria when the calendar turned over to 1500. Many people thought the world was going to end. So there's a great deal of interest in the apocalyptic scenarios in the book of Revelation. But that fourth horseman there um, in a black and white print, you don't see he's on a white horse. He's traditionally represented on a white horse. But the guy in the back with the bow and arrow, that is pestilence or plague or pest, as it's known in many European languages because illnesses seem to come out of nowhere and strike people down arbitrarily. Um, there was very little understanding of how diseases were transferred. 
Um, and actually, in the news media today, a lot of the old imagery that has been dredged up and used to illustrate the Black Death is not actually showing the bubonic plague at all. It's often showing smallpox or leprosy, equally devastating diseases, equally mysterious in their transmission and origin, um, equally akin to the bolt out of nowhere that strikes someone down. Uh, a couple of medieval manuscript illustrations. Here we have God showering arrows of plague down on poor little human beings um, and St. Francis and Mary and other saints interceding on behalf of humans, um, praying for them to be rescued. And in effect, you can see Mary's catching some of those arrows um, in her gown there. Uh, and here we have another manuscript illustration, uh, God outsourcing the task to some demons who are using arrows to strike people down with uh, pestilence. Pestilence, an all-encompassing category, but it did include definitely the plague. Um, so that uh, helps us understand where a very popular saint comes from and his imagery and his association with the plague. That is Saint Sebastian. Saint Sebastian was an early Christian in the um, early Christian late Roman era. He was a soldier and he, they attempted, the soldiers attempted to kill him for not giving homage to the Roman emperor. Um, this was blasphemous and so he needed to die. Christians needed to be taught a lesson and he was shot full of arrows. Um, it didn't work. He was actually rescued by Saint Irene and nursed back to life and eventually more successfully martyred by being clubbed to death. A much, um, well, I guess it's an equally brutal death. But because of that association of the first attempt to martyr him being done with arrows, arrows being the symbol of pestilence, Saint Sebastian becomes one of the most popular saints in Europe because pestilence, plague, disease is so frequent. And Saint Francis is one of those saints who can pray on your behalf to God, bringing your concerns in popular Christian tradition at that time. Um, he's very popular, he's often represented. I'm showing you the tamest possible representation of Saint Sebastian. If you're curious, you can just do a Google image search for more. Uh, but this is by yet another um, follower of Caravaggio, this uh, French follower, Georges de la Tour, showing us Saint Irene coming to rescue Sebastian. Um, and Saint Irene helps us transition to another topic, a related topic. Um, how we care for those who are cut down by disease. And when something like the plague rips through town and in Florence and in Siena and central, central Italy between 1348 and uh, 1351, um, scholars estimate 50%, 60% of the population died over the course of months. So you just need to imagine your own town or city 50%, 60% of the population dying over the course of months, let's say from March to August, and imagine everything that gets lost. There is, of course, the personal devastation of losing loved ones, but there is institutional memory. There is professional expertise. There are social networks of who does what best, and all of that is lost. Uh, society is thrown into total chaos, and you can see that here in this very um, jumbled, busy, frantic looking image of people trying to bury the dead as fast as they die. Burying the dead was an act of charity. People understood that it was dangerous, and poor people in particular had no one to bury them. So burying the dead became folded into one of the seven acts of mercy. Um, in the Middle Ages, there are lots of little formulas to help people to remember what they need to do and what they need to avoid. Seven virtues, seven vices, seven acts of mercy. Um, here we have a painting from the late 15th century. Once the plague enters Europe, it never really goes away. We have wave, waves of plague coming through well into the late 17th century. Uh, and here a French painter, actually he's Belgian, giving us an image of people burying the dead, um, the rights for the dead being spoken by the priests and the clergy actually took a huge hit at the time of the plague because they went out and buried the dead and were infected themselves as this grave digger is here um, you can't see it very well but on his neck is a great big red swelling 
to show that by doing his Christian duty to help bury the dead, he has put himself in danger. Um, something for us to think about that by doing the right thing today, we might sometimes have to expose ourselves to the things we're most afraid of. And up in the sky, you can see St. Sebastian doing his work, even as he is like the human pincushion, they are stuck full of arrows. Um, burying the dead and the works of charity gave rise to yet more striking images. Here are a couple of pictures from Spain, another follower of Caravaggio, Juan de Valdez Leal. Um, doing a commission for the Hospital of Charity, La Caridad Hospital in Seville, which was a lay confraternity, a kind of monastic order that ordinary people who were not monks and nuns could join, uh, provided they agreed to dedicate their extra time and energy and money to the works of mercy, in particular that of burying the dead. This image here, um, one of two pendants, I'll show you the second in just a moment, um, emphasizing the fleetness of life and the necessity of seeing our life in correct perspective and keeping our priorities straight. So here we have death with his sickle. He's got a coffin under his arm. Um, he's a really strong guy, even though he has no muscles. Um, and the intent is in the words there, in ictu oculi, in the blink of an eye. Um, all of your worldly accomplishments and possessions mean nothing. Uh, so we have a bishop's mitre and a king's crown and all kinds of fancy clothing, tokens of learning and scholarship, of exploration, of territorial expansion, all of it um, meaningless in the face of death. Um, next up in that series, um, Leal also did um, images of the seven works of mercy, but we have the pendant image, the end of worldly glory. And in the pans of the balance there, on the left, we have nothing more than all of these vices, all of these fripperies and all of these luxuries can send you to hell and nothing less than all of these um, focuses on God, on God's church and on God's people can um, keep you on the right path headed toward God. And in this painting, the pans are exactly equal. Um, what's going to tip the balance? And beneath, we have this very gruesome and scary image of uh, a high-ranking church official, a high-ranking knight. Um, this image here is of uh, the Knights of Calatrava, one of the most prestigious orders in Spain. And in the background, you can see piles of bones and other, other ordinary folks who have died. So worldly glory ends in nothing. The only thing that matters is how you are weighed by Christ in the end. And you can see that hand has a wound in it. That's the hand of the risen Christ um, carrying out this judgment here. So burying the dead, the works of mercy, uh, keeping our perspectives correct by remembering that our time on this earth is short and finite and um, we can't predict when it will end. So keep our eyes on what matters. Lastly, I'll just say a few words about a little spat that opened up in the history of art um, about specifically the role of the Black Death in the development of painting and style in the Renaissance. So uh, Millard Meese here in 1951 published a book, painting and, painting in Florence and Siena after the Black Death, contending that uh, this event brought to a screeching halt all of the interesting experiments and novel developments that had begun in the world of painting around 1300. Those of you who have had some art history might have heard the name of Giotto. He's the person we normally start the story of the Italian Renaissance in the Western naturalistic tradition. We start with Giotto. And Mice practicing a newer kind of art history that was less about pure style and more about social context, um, offered the thesis that um, this shock to the system, this massive frightful thing that happened, uh, scared people away from those kinds of experiments and shocked them back into what art historians viewed as a more retrograde and less advanced type of painting. Um, you lay down a big thesis like that and you attract a lot of attention and people are still kind of fighting about it today. You can see one book, Judith Steinhoff, 2007, 
Um, she stylistically comes to agree with much of Mises' argument, saying that we do see um, a lot of more conservative painting at that time. Uh, but she nuances it a little bit more, um, looking specifically at what happened to artists' studios after the Black Death. If half of your apprentices and masters die, um, there is a lot of skill that's lost that had been developing and coming to fruition. Uh, she also pays close attention to the patrons. Um, a work like this played a key role in Mises' argument that art after the Black Death became very conservative and retrograde. This is a Dominican altarpiece in the big Dominican church in Florence, uh, paid for by the wealthy Strozzi family, so it's sometimes known as the Strozzi altarpiece. But it has a gold background. The figures are all um, mostly frontal or profile, quite static. It is very backward looking stylistically, uh, if we want to use that term. Um, someone like Judith Steinhoff would say it's not necessarily backward looking. It is in keeping with the tastes of the Dominicans. The Dominicans are the guardians of orthodoxy and the hunters of heresy. They are the uh, supporters of tradition and the articulators of tradition. So it is unlikely that you're going to find the most cutting edge, experimental, innovative, stylistically um, on the border art in a Dominican context. Uh, right around the corner from this altarpiece is another fresco that played a key role in Mises' argument. Again, Dominican. Uh, it's a big tableau of all of the things that go into salvation through the church in uh, classic medieval understanding. Um, it is very stylistically, we could say, backward looking. Judith Steinhoff would say stylistically traditional in accord with the tastes and the goals of the Dominican patrons. So all of that, just to give you a taste of what remembering one's death looks like in the history of art, how the Christian tradition of burying the dead, of interceding for those who have been struck down with a sudden illness come to fruition in pictures to um, guide and shape people's imaginations and people's Christian practice. Uh, and then at the end, a little more technical, um, less religious and more um, art historical disciplinary spat about how we make sense of something like this in the history of art. I thank you for your attention and perhaps we'll have time at some point to ask questions.